Okay, good evening. Uh, tonight we are continuing our study of the Dhammapada, looking at verse one, twelve, verse two, twelve, which reads as follows: Piyato jayati soko. Piyato jayati bhayang. Piyato vipamutasa nati soko kuto bhayang. Which means what is dear from what is dear from what is cherished comes sorrow. From what is cherished comes fear. For one who is freed from holding things, from cherishing. There is no sorrow, whence fear, meaning how could there be fear? So this uh, verse was taught in regards to a man who had lost his son. Very simple story, there's not much to it. The story goes that there was this man in the time of the Buddha. I think we've had stories like this. In fact, uh, this the, the second verse of the Dhammapada is a very similar story. This man lost his son and just spent all his time wailing and moaning and, and bemoaning his loss. Losing a child, no? It's one of the things we never wish. We, we are not, no, we never wish. That it's hard to beat the loss of a child, meaning the loss of a parent is sad, but something you can live with, but the worst, the most dreadful thing is the loss of, a, of one's child, which you know should never happen in the grand scheme of things, if there were a grand scheme. And the Buddha found out about this man and thought to himself, oh, there's someone who might be able to understand the Dhamma. We hear these stories and it sounds like it sounds like we Buddhists, are, we're always keen to find those people who are miserable. We think, boy, they'd make a good Buddhist. It's not really fair, but it sounds, it, it, can, it becomes suspiciously like that, where you think religion might be leveled this accusation that religion preys upon those who are uh, desperate or those who are vulnerable. And it certainly is possible a person who is vulnerable can be preyed upon even by people calling themselves religious. But th that's an uncharitable connection, of course, because religion in 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 most cases tries to or or claims to or works towards answering questions that science and society can't you know you bought into society did everything right and still everything goes wrong what's wrong so it, it tries to look beyond right it claims that there's something beyond buddhism as well claims that there's something beyond society even beyond science Science can tell you all sorts of things about the brain and the body. Can't tell you much about the mind or the psyche. So this man was miserable and he'd done everything right. He was, I think, probably quite wealthy and I certainly wasn't destitute, but here he was reduced to ruin not by loss of wealth or loss of status, but by loss of something that he couldn't buy, he couldn't 
hold on to with money or power or even intelligence and logic and reasoning. So it goes beyond that. What, what do you do when you lose your child? And the Buddha went to him and asked him, why are you crying? The man told him and the Buddha said, you know, Wise people don't act in this way, he said. He's, he wasn't critical. I may, I may sound a little harsh when I tell it, but he wasn't so harsh. He said, in ancient times, laymen, householder, he would call them householder. In ancient times, when a man lost his son, he wouldn't cry. He would think to himself, and here we have a Pali, that's probably a good one to remember, uh, I was just trying to marana matang, no marana dhammang matang, bijana dhammang bindang, which means what is of a nature to die has died. What is of a nature to break apart has broken. And it and he taught this in reference, and then he and he taught also the uh, urajataka. Uragaja, no, Uragajataka, Urago, Uragajataka. Uraga means snake, it's a snake jataka. <clears throat> and it only tangentially has to do with the snake because this man loses his son to a snake, a snake bites his son. I once met a monk in, I lived with a monk in Sri Lanka, a very good close friend at the, when I was there, and just a great monk. When he was young, his sister, his younger sister, got bitten by a cobra and died. This kind of thing happens. And in the Uraga Jataka, this, this was the Bodhisatta who was the father. And the story tells that since he got married and had kids through his whole household career as a, as a father, as a head of a household, he taught his whole family and they taught each other and they talked uh, constantly about death. They would remind each other of death and talk about it. It was a, it was a open and common co uh, topic of conversation. I find it funny that um, how, how shocking, the shock value of talking about death, often when we bring it up and talk about how you might die and and people are disturbed right it's 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 kind of funny because of how taboo it all not taboo but how uh, un impolite it is to talk about death in our in many cultures probably most cultures besides really hardcore buddhist circles <clears throat> um so this was a, i think probably at the time quite um, uh, unique or, or exceptional And today thinking about it It's exceptional Talking to your kids about death What a horrible thing, right? My parents never talked to me about death But as a result When this son died If you read the story It's a really good jataka One of the ones worth reading One of the ones especially worth reading Especially for the verses, and he says things like this: uh, if, if you spill milk, the milk jug breaks, or you no, know, if a pot breaks, you don't cry. Crying won't bring it back. Bijana dhammang binang. What has of a nature to break has broken. Life is of a nature to break. And he taught the Uraga Jataka. I told the story of this man and how they burnt the sun and. The son's body and and this man came along and said, oh, "That must be an enemy of yours. You're burning." He said, "No, no, this is my son." He says, "What? How could this be? You're all here, very peaceful and serene, and and not crying and not upset." And he, this man talks to all the family, and they all recite verses and say, "If you call the moon down, wish for the moon and 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 yell at the moon to come down, it it won't come." can't bring my son back. 
Each verse had a different way of putting it. So he told the Uraga Jataka here and then taught this verse. Very simple story. As a result of teaching the verse, I think the man became a Sotapanna. He was able to gain a new perspective on things. So he was someone, the Buddha picked out these people who were just ripe. Not like us, we all have to work very, very hard to even to get anywhere. The Buddha picked the low-hanging fruit, the people who are ready, because I mean, it's a good example, teaching those people who are ready and are interested in, in learning. Um, instead of trying to, encur trying to encourage people who don't want to learn and pull people who don't want to learn in, often we make that mistake, trying to pull in people because they're our friends or our family members. And it, you, it's a lot of, lot of work for very little a benefit. Whereas instead, if you found the people who wanted to come and were, everyone would think they were crazy, but they're crazy enough to come to a place like this and dedicate themselves to walking back and forth and sitting very still, repeating mantras in their heads. If we, if we focus on those people, we have much better results for much less effort, and so it's efficient. And those people go out and help other people, and, and it spreads that way. Buddhism has never been a proselytizing religion for that reason. It's a difficult thing to practice Buddhism. We teach those people who are ready, who are interested, who are often miserable, but most important are uh, sensitive. And right? a person who is on the upswing, who has everything good in their lives, is often very insensitive to, to the idea that something might go wrong, that something might break. Sometimes, uh, again, the difference between brains even. Apparently our brains are different, which makes sense. Meaning some people uh, are much more susceptible to suffering than others. Something goes wrong, they react neg more negatively. Other people are... Um, insulated from it, meaning something bad happens and they're very quick to rebound, it's just by, based on how the brain works. And of course you can train that to some extent, but to some extent it's organic, it's the way the brain is, is composed and so on. That's what it appears to the scientist. I mean, it seems reasonable. But so those people for whom it's very hard to see uh, the negative, right? If something bad happens, you forget about it very quickly. It's very hard to see the potential for disaster because there isn't really. You're insulated. Temporarily, of course. And the bigger picture is really what this verse is, is uh, part of what this verse is talking about. So the verse has three key words. The first one is cherish, what is cherish. The second one is sadness. And the third is fear. And the idea that uh, be, well, something that is cherished doesn't lead to happiness, doesn't lead to contentment and bliss and, and a good life, doesn't lead to goodness. We kind of have this idea, I suppose, that um, the, the, the things that we like, the things that bring us happiness, that happiness is goodness. Right? We put the cart before the horse, whereas in Buddhism, goodness leads to happiness. We seek out happiness in the world. In Buddhist, Buddhism, it's not that way. Well, in Buddhism, we see through that and see that seeking out happiness isn't good. Happiness doesn't lead to goodness. It doesn't even lead to happiness. But we cherish things, and this is the idea behind the story, and this whole chapter, of course, is um, a chapter on things that are cherished. and. So putting stress, giving it a whole chapter, gives us this idea that there was a recognition of how important it is, this concept of things that we cherish, concept of holding things dear, which ultimately comes down to what we like, and it's this idea of craving and, and clinging and addiction and so on. So... What, what I think is interesting about this verse and, and this teaching is it's what we talked about last week and what we'll talk about for the, well, not next week, but for quite a few uh, verses for this whole chapter probably. But um, what is interesting is this separation here between 
the distinction between sorrow and fear, which I think is interesting. So, the idea that the idea that uh, holding something dear could lead to to sorrow. The the, I mean, so the the clear the clear idea is that when you want when you like things when there are things that you hold dear you might lose them and if you lose them that will be great suffering and this of course applies to people it applies to things that it's the idea sort of the concept one of the concepts of suffering in Buddhism that you might lose it and if you lose it that would be suffering but the idea of fear. And here fear is it's it's a synonym or it's the same word that they use for danger. And it seems a little bit odd because in English of course they're two very different words, fear and danger, but the the idea, the commonality behind them is the anticipation or the the concern for the potential of suffering, right? When you fear something you don't fear what is happening to you, right? If someone, if, if you're in great pain, you're not afraid of the pain. You're afraid of what might come as a result of the pain. And you might say it's a disliking or an aversion to a, a concept. So fear isn't actually, I don't think, a, it's not a real thing in, 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 it's not a real experience. But when we experience fear, what we call something fear, what we're experiencing is a concept, a thought, right? Suppose... There's a spider and you're afraid of the spider. You're not afraid of the spider. You're afraid of, or you have a concept of it, it jumping you, it attacking you, biting you, or crawling on you even, right? And that fear is, is of the anticipation. The, that's not even quite, it's more complicated because if the, you can have, see a spider on, on you and just be freaked out by the touch, but it's still very much associated with the idea that the spider might bite you or that sort of thing. Anyway, and the point is ultimately it comes down to a simple mind state. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that you, you can have all the things that you love. You can be surrounded by the people that you love and still suffer. And suffer not because you've lost something, not because you can't get what you want, not because you've gotten what you don't want, but simply because you could lose what you want. And this is uh, something that makes meditation stand out, mindfulness stand out, because of the, uh, the insight that it gives into the suffering inherent in having things that you cherish. That it's not just the sadness that comes from not getting what you want, but it's the constant, not constant, but ever-present, uh, incessant and repeated and, and regular appearance of terror, of fear, of worry, the concern that you might lose what you have. Sometimes this is why of course, thinking about death is so powerful. Why it's important for us to think about death? Because death is sort of the, the biggest thing that we might fear, but there's many others. Think about all the things that you own. Think about your house, your car. Think about your family, more deeply valued things, your, your relatives. What if your parents died? What if your children died? What if your siblings and friends and lovers, what if they all died? What if you lost your health? What if you got sick? What if you got in a car accident? What if you lost all your money? I mean, many things. Anything that we hold dear. What if suddenly you were bankrupt? You had no money. What if suddenly this house burnt down and we were all here, regardless of what future aid we might get, we were all forced to go and walk out in the cold and the snow? Bringing up, I mean, not everything, many things that are like this, you bring them up to someone and and they, it scares them. And this points to something very important, I think, that meditation, mindfulness shows us 
the true nature of cherishing, the true nature of holding things dear, the state, the truth about this state of, of craving things and clinging to things and loving things. And that that love is always going to be tainted with fear, with danger. Not just danger, I think fear is here more relevant. Because someone can be oblivious to the danger. But when someone fears losing what they have, it's almost as bad or, or perhaps as bad as actually losing the thing because it's constant, it's incessant. And so in, in our meditation we see the not only potential for loss, but the very real stress that comes from holding on to things. Right? Sometimes you want something, you can't get it, you suffer. But sometimes you have something, you're afraid you might lose it. You have stress over it or worry over keeping it. And it goes beyond fear as well. It goes to um, the simple stress involved with wanting things. When you want something and then you're concerned about getting it or worried about how to get it or have to think about how to get it. Many, many things that you see in meditation. And what I think also bears noting is how how ignorant we are to this without the practice of mindfulness. It, it almost seems like a silly thing to say that things you have you might you you might lose them and that there's this fear associated because our perspective of thinking that happiness comes from getting what you want not the buddhist perspective the the ordinary perspective of thinking if i get what i want if i work things out in life and work hard and get everything okay then i'll be happy this idea has an inherent, an implicit assumption. So it's something we already know and kind of assume, generally, I think, uh, that it's precarious, that there is always going to be this concern because part of getting what you want means keeping what you have, keeping what you want, what you like. And keeping what you like involves some stress, some work, some worry, some fear. You have to protect it. And so the point in that, what I mean to say is this kind of happiness, the happiness of ordinary society where people have houses and they have jobs and they have families and so on, is always going to be inferior, is always going to be lacking. And when people say they're happy in life, it's really simply because they haven't really been mindful. And their lack of mindfulness keeps them oblivious to how much stress and suffering is involved, how um, limited their happiness is. No matter how happy you can be, you think, I'm so happy, I've got everything I want. How limited that is. It's limited by sorrow when you lose, when you can't get the things you want, when the things you want change or so on. But it's also the stress of having to keep worrying about keeping, worrying about losing. And so the end of the verse, Nati Soko Kuto, kuto Nati Soko Kuto Bhayang, for someone who frees themselves, Vipamutta, someone who becomes free from cherishing. It's an odd thing to say, right? We don't think of ourselves needing to be freed from it. We leap head first into cherishing. Yes, cherish, dearly beloved. I mean, the, our, our whole culture, most cultures in the world are about cherishing Hold on to the things you cherish Find something you love, do something you love Yeah, not in Buddhism In mindfulness we see differently We come to, we make claims about seeing through that And claims about the limited nature of cherishing And and. and more importantly, for this part of the verse, the 
the constraint and the binding and the servitude involved with cherishing things. That in fact we are not in charge. In fact, even if we wanted to stop cherishing things, we couldn't. If we wanted to stop holding things dear and suddenly we say, okay, my son is dead, I don't love him anymore. <laughs> Let's just get rid of that attachment now because it's no good to me. Even if we wanted to do that, most people don't. They're quite happy to suffer. Um, even if we wanted to, we couldn't. We couldn't because we, we're ignorant, because we don't see the stress and suffering. We don't realize the the trap that we're stuck in. We don't see clearly. So through the, our practice of meditation here, you you might find yourself letting go of some things. It can be scary. It can be scary because you think, oh, what about all those things I love? I'm going to lose them? But what you will find is not that suddenly you've lost things that you love. You'll find yourself gradually letting go, gradually opening up to to possibilities, possibilities of what we call loss and, and, and gain, getting things you don't want, losing things you do want. But we call them those things, but it's simply, really, in reality, it's just change. You open yourself up to change. Change no longer threatens you. It's no longer scary. It's no longer dangerous. Vipamutta, you become freed, released from the bondage of having to find happiness in things. Your happiness, your peace comes from, from, comes from freedom. So, a good verse, another one of these verses about cherishing. We're going to have many more, I think. And this verse is verse 212 of 423. There are 423 verses in the Dhammapada. We've covered 212, which means we've passed halfway with this verse. So thank you all for keeping up and uh, your interest in the Dhamma and interest in the practice. Thank you all for being here and practicing. I wish you all the best in your practice. That's the Dhammapada. Thank you. Have a good night.